Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. Last week, Adam, my parents came over for Mother's Day weekend. We celebrated a little early because my parents were in town. And my dad started talking to me about some of the new security initiatives that are going on in his company. And one of the things he said, he was really interested in our podcast show from previous for Zscaler because their company is rolling out Zscaler. As well as their company is rolling out MFA for O365. And he went off on how much he dislikes both of these products because of how they're being rolled out. Nobody sent out any communication about Zscaler. And so it just kind of appeared on computers. And he was like, well, I used to be able to go to this place and download these files and do all these things, but now I can't. And then for MFA, he was saying that he had to authenticate or MFA every so often, whatever the interval was set to. And sometimes it would MFA in the middle of a call or something like that. And he'd have to rush over to his phone and get the authenticator app and authenticate. And then of course, you know, because he's an engineer and he has all sorts of different machines for testing. He's got a Linux machine that's not domain joined that doesn't get the Zscaler agent. And so he's like, oh, I can still download my files from this machine. So he's basically circumventing security controls because when you make people's lives difficult, they try to find a way around it. So I wanted to kind of dedicate this show here to talk about how to roll out a security product when you identify something that either it's a policy that you have that you need to enable or maybe it's a configuration change or maybe it's an actual tool that you purchased a product that you purchased and you need to roll it out to your company and how do you do that so first things first when you're at a company and you're a blue teamer and you're an information security person professional and you have it you've identified a vulnerability or an issue or something that needs to get changed to increase your security posture sometimes that's a policy change like we flip on the switch and we change it within the policy or maybe it's a configuration change within a specific tool or an endpoint we change something within an endpoint, a GPO or an Intune configuration. Maybe it's a compliance policy. Or maybe we went out and we got wooed by some vendors and we ended up buying a tool. And now we have to buy the tool. And now we have to deploy the tool. And a lot of companies are learning this too because if you buy a tool and you don't deploy it, then come time for renewal, you probably won't renew. So there's incentives for companies to deploy. And so... You do want to deploy the tool that you purchased that you spent a lot of money on. Every single tool, every single configuration has impact on users, right? And so you kind of have to think about how it's going to impact the user. And what you don't want is for the users to have a negative perception that security is trying to prevent them from doing their job. I think you and I, Adam, we've talked about it many times on the show where security should be a business enabler. And I think there's a lot of people who may have that sort of legacy thinking where we have to come in and bring the hammer down and make sure that the users aren't doing certain things or to put a policy in place so that we block this sort of behavior from happening And we don't think about the impact. And just from a personal side, when I was at my previous company before coming to Microsoft, I was in blue teaming and I did, you know, kind of project management on deploying security tools because we were a smaller organization. Then went to Microsoft and kind of was in that position where I'm telling 
customers what they should be doing, what they should be deploying, right? And it's more fast paced environment and kind of going from customer to customer and seeing all these different things and telling them what to do, but you never really like see it through your, you know, I wasn't in a position to actually help them deploy the tools. And then going back to corporate IT, it took me a while to figure that out again. I went back there with the vendor mindset thinking, oh, I'm going to just turn these on. Yeah, just turn it on, just do the thing, right? And I ended up breaking a lot of things, like, you know, the first six months I was there. And it wasn't good. I mean, it took a little while to gain the trust of everyone who I was working with back because they thought that I was there and I was breaking all these things and preventing them from doing their jobs. And so I had a lot of hard lessons that were learned. So hopefully throughout the show, we can kind of help you along and you won't make those mistakes that I did or you won't have that negative experience that my dad is having when someone's rolling out a security tool. Yeah, I, I I'm love this discussion because change management, especially as it relates to user experience, is something that's, to kind of use a tired phrase, everybody's job. It's everyone's job in IT to enable the business, to deliver a great user experience, and to make the organization secure and productive. And thinking through the different experiences users may have or the different challenges they may run into and remembering that they are almost universally not going to be as technical as folks who sit in IT is super important in building that empathy, which we talk about a lot on the show as well. Also very, very critical to be successful. So let's get into it. So let's say we have identified an issue and we need to make a change or we need to deploy a tool. I think the first thing that you need to look at is buy-in from IT is how I look at it. And that's how we approach it at our company now is that, okay, let's test it out between maybe the security team and maybe some really close people that you work with really close to IT uh, or really close to security, like maybe infrastructure or the cloud engineers or someone that you trust that they know that, hey, they're going to be in a test group, but they're very technical. And if there's issues, they can either figure it out themselves or they know that you're going to take care of them because two technical people can really figure out what's going on with it. Once you get the buy-in of that and you've successfully tested the change that you're going to make among a small group of people, then you really need to try to convince the decision makers, if you're not the decision maker, right? Like you'll need to put together a somewhat technical presentation, probably for your boss and his boss, and then possibly the rest of IT to convince them to make the change possible, to say, hey, this is why we're going to make the change, or this is why we, we bought this tool, or... This is why we're going to deploy this configuration policy because we have this particular vulnerability. We have this risk that we need to mitigate and we're going to make this change. And so you got to be able to convince them that they're not going to have a lot of user impact or that you're going to try to mitigate that as much as possible because you're probably dealing with people in IT like the network team that worries about network availability, not necessarily network security. I mean, network security is part of it, but they're really worried about keeping the network available and up for users and for the business. You're probably dealing with the desktop team and the help desk team because they're worried about how many tickets are going to come in. Are they going to be overwhelmed? Are the users going to have a good user experience? because they're the ones who are going to hear about it if something bad happens. And so you have to be able to put together a good plan on paper, at least to kind of convince them, sell them, if you will, of your vision of how this thing is going to go down. 
I think you touched on something really interesting there, which is that selling to IT first is a great first step. Because if people who do have some technical background and some technical interest can't be sold on your vision or why you need to do something or understand the necessity of it, then you're probably not going to get users to buy into it either. And that's a great place to start. And then everything Andy laid out completely true as far as writing a detailed plan, persuading decision makers to buy into it. That's all part of it. And Hey, remember when we did a show several weeks ago, a couple months ago, whenever it was on how we got into information security or then skills you need to get into information security, we talk about ability to be persuasive, ability to write effectively, communicate effectively, present effectively. Here's your example right here. Hey, you want to improve the security for the organization. You need buy-in. You're going to have to do these things. And if you can't write well or present well or pres be persuasive, you're going to have a rough time with that. So love the idea of selling into IT. And, and I can say personally from my past life experience, I ran into times not frequently, but not rare either, when as a technologist and as someone who definitely has always had an inf interest in information security, sometimes I question the decision making of InfoSec. They would do things that I didn't agree with or I wasn't bought into. And oftentimes there wasn't that outreach to even sell it internally to IT. And I think that's really, really critical because if someone somewhere in the business then starts complaining about it, and they get a foothold in IT, now you're really fractured and you're not getting that organizational buy-in to deliver change. So it's really important you get the wagon circled, so to speak, with all of IT and all of the technologists before you expand more broadly. And so typically how I go about this at our company, and it works differently wherever you are, but you know, just as an example, I usually pitch it to my boss and I pitch it to my team first. And then I reach out to a couple of test users that I have. If, if it all works out okay, I usually write up an email or some sort of presentation for my boss to then give to IT leaders. So he has to be knowledgeable about the change, knowledgeable about the technical details, why we're doing it and all that other stuff. And he usually will then present it to IT leaders who are then managers and directors across the board to try to get their buy-in. And his political capital has been built up over years. And so that relationship building at the director and CISO level is very, very important. So it's usually not a hard sell to try to get buy-in from IT leaders once my boss has buy-in but it all depends on the relationships that you've built over the years and the trust that you have. And that can be different if you have a new CISO or someone comes in as a brand new leader in information security, sometimes they want to make a big splash, right? They, they come in, they're like, why are we do is using this tool or why are we doing this? Like we should be using a different tool or have a different configuration and let's just make that change. I'm going to drop the hammer. And that's when you can lose trust like I did initially at my company where I made a change, it didn't go well and it broke people's things and it took me a while to get that trust back. So that's how it works at our company. And when we're doing those pitches, we think about how the users are affected and what the impact's going to be. Some changes, they may be organization wide, but they may not have a major impact on users or they may not notice it at all or be very, very minimal at best. So one example of a change that we recently made was there's a feature in Azure where it dictates if a user can use their work or M365 credentials to OAuth to third-party apps. And so there's three settings. One is users allowed. The other setting on the other side is they're not allowed and it has to have admin. And there's a new setting in the middle that says approved apps through Microsoft or vetted apps, trusted apps are okay. 
Otherwise, you can dictate specific permissions that are okay. So if an app meets some permissions that you've already dictated are okay, you can do that, or an admin has to approve it. So it's not something that happens all the time, but there are users who are OAuthing using your credentials all the time just to one-offs to different apps here and there. And so that was a change that was made organization-wide, but because it didn't have a huge user impact right away and it doesn't revoke any of the original OAuth permissions, only new apps that are getting onboarded would notice that change. And if it's already approved, it's not going to have an impact. And so that was something that we made the decision. We communicated it just to IT and we made the change. And there have been a couple of people who have said, hey, I tried to add this app to using my credentials and I can't anymore and then I'll go in and review it. If it's good, I'll approve it. If not, I'll say, hey, this app requires all these permissions. Is this a business critical app or are you just you know, using it because you like it? So it was a good way to control things, but because there wasn't a big impact, we didn't have to go through all the hoops. Now, things like Zscaler, where there's a major user impact, that's not something that you would just deploy the agent through SCCM and turn it on right away without any communication or tuning even because it's a web security gateway. You're going to need to tune it. Otherwise, your user is going to get blocked going to things. So you got to think about the impact and that can dictate your level of communication and planning. One thing I think is important to consider is have we provided an alternative if we're just preventing something from happening? Like are are users doing this to get their work done because we haven't given them a better way to do it? Then we need to have an alternative in place. A lot of times should before we take it away. Obviously that's not always feasible, especially if there's something that's a massive security risk, but making sure that we've put credible alternatives in place before we restrict access to things just makes sense. And I, I will give credit. I think five years ago, there was a lot more of, oh, shadow IT, we need to shut it down. And it's like, but people are using that to get their work done and they don't have a good tool internally to do that. And I don't care, it's security risk, you know? And today I think it's a lot better of, oh, geez, okay, we have a gap in this space. Let's onboard a sanctioned tool before we restrict access to everything else. And so like in your OAuth example, you restricted access moving forward, but you didn't pull anything away from people. And that gave you time then, now that you've kind of stopped the bleeding, so to speak, to go back through and revalidate those different applications. And as you're having those conversations, I'm sure part of that is, you know, is this a business critical need? Um, are there alternative tools that could also meet this requirement? And if not, probably kind of allowing it to go on a little longer or escalating it to a higher level decision maker. But it, it's certainly something I think we've done better at, but we can continue to improve on is make sure that if we're going to impact users, there's a really good reason why we're going to take away something. And we've explained that and we've given credible alternatives. So I, I like all of the, the kind of communication and thought process you talked about there. The other thing a lot of times is we'll deploy a tool or we'll think about making a change. And the question comes up is who's going to support it if something goes wrong? Because it could be a network tool that we're doing and maybe the network team is going to have some sort of support for it. But if you're pushing a tool for security, you know they're, they might push back and be like, well, it's your tool and so we shouldn't have to support it. Or maybe you're training certain folks to do the initial support and then escalating to your team. Because most of the time, security teams are smaller than desktop support and network and infrastructure combined, right? You may only have one, two, maybe five people max, whereas support, help desk, and infrastructure and network combined, usually you're going to have a larger amount of people to do that support. So you got to think about having documents or training sessions for these folks 
provide that first line support if necessary. Maybe you do it as part of the initial rollout. And then for continued operations, you train somebody else to do it. But there has to be buy-in again from those managers. They're taking on additional workload to support a tool that you're deploying. This is a huge one. And I, I have scar tissue from this one in particular. So maybe not so much a security tool, more as a compliance tool, but I'll tell my story briefly here. In a past life, I was an exchange administrator for Exchange Online. And we had evaluated and decided to roll out data loss prevention for Office 365. And our first kind of workload was looking at email and looking at things like bank routing numbers and credit card numbers that were being transmitted through email because we had a lot of independent agents who didn't, you know, hadn't had an agent relationship with this organization, but were essentially independent contractors, right? That wasn't really their boss necessarily. And they would do things like send bank routing numbers through email, send credit card numbers through email on and on and on. So we put this data loss prevention in place, tuned it, tested it out, got it to a point where it was not generating too many false positives. And before we started blocking anything, just started having it monitor what was going on and generate reports. Now where we screwed up and you can learn from my mistake is we didn't have anyone in place to actually follow up on those reports end to end. So yes, there were compliance people who would look through them and go, Oh, you know, Bob agent had sent a bank routing number to one of his insureds and here's the problem. So thought we had this all buttoned up, but we didn't dot our I's and cross our T's. Then they would say, okay, well, was this email sent securely? Was it sent through TLS? Now, without getting way into the weeds of email, email, modern email systems will attempt to send TLS, transport layer security, when it is supported on both ends. It's called opportunistic TLS, where we'll try to do it if we can, but we reserve the right that if we can't negotiate a handshake or we can't make it work, then we'll just fall back to plain text. And so they came back and knocked on the door of guess who the exchange administrators and said, Hey, can you validate if these 500 emails were sent with TLS or not? Which means pulling like an, a message trace for every single one of them and reading the logs. And that's a level of permission that normally is only for exchange administrators. So, then it started up a whole other process of, well, can we R back this role so somebody else can pull these reports? Can we train somebody to be able to read them and understand what they say? Cause they're very technical. And once we'd done all that work to teach somebody else to fish, we said, Hey, we want to teach you how to fish. And they said, no, you're not, I'm not doing that. And so again, there was no higher power to go and say, why? Yes, you are. And, um, long story short, I spent my last probably year or so at that company running message traces all the time to see if stuff was sent with TLS or not. Um, which really encouraged me to turn on and force TLS for a lot of email orgs, uh, just to make my life a little easier. If it went to Gmail, it was sent in force TLS, you know, that kind of thing. But gosh, it, when you're, when you're implementing a new program, make sure you run down all of the scenarios, all of the possibilities and that, You've dotted your I's and crossed your T's and that no matter the scenario, there is a person who is responsible for it, who has the time and has the capability and has the permission to follow up on it. Learn from my mistake on this one. Most of the time when you are rolling out a tool, there's probably some sort of collaboration that has to happen with other teams. For example, if you need a server to host an application that you're rolling out or you need to put in a network device and you'll need to have access to a rack or something like that from the network team, or maybe you're rolling out MDM and you know that involves collaborating with the device management team or the SCCM team. And so there's always going to be other teams within IT as well as folks from the business side, right? So if you have sales folks or if you have other organizations outside of IT, those leaders are going to need to know what's happening. And so 
you'll need to have some sort of collaboration, informative meetings, as well as probably part of project meetings to kind of figure out the pieces that go into it. And that involves cross-functional communication skills, communication skills, those sorts of things that we've talked about to be able to communicate across those different functions and get your point across and inform them how the tool is going to interact with them, especially if there's going to be an organization-wide change. At smaller companies, when you're rolling out a new tool, unfortunately, most of the time, you're going to be the project manager. So at my previous company before Microsoft, when we were rolling out tools, I was the project manager for that tool. I had to come up with the rollout plan. I had to do all the meetings and cross-functional communication and, and kind of spearhead the entire thing. And that can be a lot for folks who have no project management experience. If you're focused on IT and you were focused on, say, infrastructure or networking or information security, and now you have to deploy a tool, those skill sets may not be there. So it may behoove you to maybe take a training course on project management and kind of figure out what your best workflow is for those sorts of things. At larger companies, like the company that I'm at now, we have dedicated project managers, and I can't tell you how good that feels because they're the ones that have to write up the project charter, get the stakeholders, the sponsor for the charter. It's all very regimented and process-oriented, which is great. And then they're the ones that schedule all the meetings, look at the calendars to make sure everyone's free, write up all the emails and communication, at least the initial draft, and then they give them to the folks who are the ones that might have to tweak the technical language for it. And they take care of all the distribution lists and they need to go out and figure out all the project waves and milestones and who we're going to send this to first and stuff like that. So if you can get yourself a project manager, it is well worth your time because that's probably my least favorite part of rolling out a tool is doing all the project management myself. But if you're just having company, flashbacks, that's... you're talking about project <laughs> managers and uh, gosh, you reminded me how much they take ownership of some of the things that are my least favorite. And they're usually spectacularly talented at it. At least a good PM is. And you're right absolutely worth their weight in gold. They can make your life so much easier because then you can focus on just the components you need to worry about. And you're not worried about a lot of like the administrative duties or, or other things because they've got all of that. They're going to send out summaries after every meeting. They're going to stand up future meetings and make sure everyone can attend. They're going to deliver status to leadership. They're going to go harass people or, or pick on them. If like they're not being responsive and holding up the project, boy, you, you know, hell hath no fury, like a project manager scorned. <laughs> um, they're just great. And I think of so many great project managers I had along the way. And, um, some, some of them, honestly, like my best friends and some of my favorite people I've worked with in the past have been really, really good PMs. They're so worth their weight in gold. One of the things that I typically do for, changes that will affect individual users, like configuration changes. A good example is MDM. So if you're rolling out MDM at a company, the worst thing that you could probably do is just to turn it on for every single person in one day. I typically designate waves. So depending on how big your company is, depending on how many people at your help desk can support the different waves. You can designate 50 people, 100 people, 300 people. It all depends. But you probably don't want to drop MDM on a couple thousand people in one single day with zero training on how to enroll and, and all that. So typically I do it in waves, and I usually give them an amount of time. So there's an initial email that goes out and says, hey, we're going to roll out MDM. Here are all the steps. You have two weeks to enroll. 
And then after a week, we roll out another email and say, hey, just a reminder, MDMs come in, you have a week. And then I like to do a day before, say, hey, tomorrow is the day. If you don't do it, you know, you're going to get prompted to do whatever it is. Or you're going to get cut off from access or whatever mm-hmm. the, the issue or the thing that we're trying to fix is. Mm-hmm. When that happens, I, I just want to say, because this, this always comes up with almost everything that I've ever done in security, is if you give people two weeks, the majority of them are going to take two weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're going to get an initial wave, right? Like maybe 10%. At best, who are going to say, yeah, I'm going to do this thing when I see the initial email. And then a week later, they'll see it and some people will be like, oh, yeah, I remember you, that thing. Uh, maybe I'll get to it. And maybe you'll get a few more percent of people, five. And then the day of comes and then you're going to get a bunch of people who are going to try to do it the, the day before. And then, of course, that's not going to be 100%. You're still going to get roughly, in my experience, about 20 to 30% of people who don't comply with whatever's happening. And they're going to, you know, you, so you can kind of expect a 20 to 30% non compliance. And that's been my general experience. That sounds high to me, but otherwise, your, process, your experience matches mine very, very much so. And this is something where you should set expectations, especially. In again, my past life, I had a vice president who was overly sensitive to user experience to the point where he inhibited our ability to move forward and be productive. Because if anything ever impacted users, we like couldn't do it. And so this is where you need to communicate. Like, I, I, I mean, with this guy, like I had to give twenty eight days, and then I'd be like twenty one days, fourteen days, seven days, five days, three days, two days, one day six hours. Like, I mean, they got a lot of emails from me. Um, but that was kind of the expectation. This was a very, very, very like organ, uh, cultural kind of aspect of this organization. And so anyhow, you will have a big chunk of people who will just never do it until it breaks. They will wait till it breaks and then they'll go, Oh no, I don't have email now. What do I do? And then they, then they will suddenly be interested in getting on board with the program. And that's just life. That's just how it's going to work. You know, I suspect by the way, that that maps very one-to-one fashion to how people fill their gas tanks, (laughs) but it's, uh, it's, um, Although it was very similar to your experience, Andy. And when you're crafting these communications, like we talk about, you know, sending these emails out or sending the communication out of what's happening and when it's going to happen. There's always a balance between how much is too much and how much is not enough communication within the email. Because again, in my experience, if you don't put all the necessary stuff in the email, someone's going to read the email and be like, it's not in the email, right? Like you didn't put this thing in the email. You didn't communicate this. Okay. So I'll put it in the email. And then you start putting all the things in the email. And when you get to an email that is about, you know, a 300 word email, it's like a, you know, an entire page of stuff. Then you're going to lose people because they're not going to read it. To it. TLDR, right? Exactly. So what I typically do, because you don't want to get caught saying you didn't communicate this. So you do want to include all the necessary stuff in the email. You can do a couple of other things on top of that. Put all the most important information right at the top, different coloring, bold, whatever it is. And then all the rest of the stuff at the bottom, all the things that they might expect, things that might happen. You can also redirect them to maybe like a KB site or something like that. Put a link in here and say, hey, if you're interested, here are some FAQs. Here are some troubleshooting steps. Here are some things that you can do. Here's the walkthrough for it, right? It's a link that you take somewhere else. That way it kind of shortens up everything and they can Mm -hmm. click on it and go to it later. But all the information that is absolutely necessary. Hey, here's the date that's going to happen. Here's the stuff that you have to do. And this is what's going to happen if you don't do it, right? So... Again, there's a tipping point, Mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. The users aren't going to read it, not enough, and you'll get called out on it. You know, 
I've probably said this on the show before, but if I haven't, this will be the first, but not the last time I will say this on the show. I often think of the fact that the iPhone has never shipped with an instruction manual. Not ever. In the box, you get a little fold out pamphlet and it's maybe, you know, 10 little panels on each side or five or something like that. And it walks through like, here's where the power button is. Here's the volume buttons. Here's how you tap on an app icon. Here's how you go home. And that's like it. Now there is a full on instruction manual that Apple writes and you can get to it's published on the web. You can get an ebook of it, but generally speaking, 99% of the people will never, ever, ever, ever see that they just get the pamphlet. And that's part of like that Apple persona where it suggests by the fact that there isn't an instruction manual that you do not need one. And this is where the challenge Andy is articulating is so hard to get the balance, right? Because the longer and more complicated the email is a, you're right. People won't read it, but B people will go, well, this is complicated and I am not capable of understanding this or following this. So I'm not going to do it on the contrary. If you don't send enough, they go, well, you didn't tell me everything I needed to do when I got lost. Some people want like literally step-by-step -step instructions. They want a screenshot for every single click. Some people are like, give me the highlights. I'll figure it out. And we're trying to do both and it's impossible to do both. So what do you do? That's why you get paid the big bucks in security is trying to figure that out because it is an impossible balancing act. And honestly, nobody's got any right. I think Andy's approach is really the closest to correct I've heard. And I will say it matches how Microsoft communicates changes internally. When we get an email, um, to use like a journalism phrase, you know, when you get the newspaper and it's folded in half, there's a journalism phrase of above the fold. So like anything that's above the fold, when you get the newspaper and it says like here, the Des Moines register, and then the headlines that are there before you have to flip it over. That's the most important story is above the fold on any given newspaper page. Um, your email should be kind of that same concept, right? Where everything that's the most important, like deadlines, dates, like two sentences of what's happening should be quote unquote above the fold. Like when I click on it in the preview and outlook, that's, what's going to be on my screen on most people's screens. And then everything else, all the technical details as kind of the CYA. So somebody can't come back and say, you didn't tell me this is below the fold. And I think that's the best approach. And again, that's how, a lot of our change emails at Microsoft are written because it'll be like, what's happening? We are upgrading the Wi-Fi at the Des Moines office. Uh, when will it be impacted? It will be down from this day to this day. Uh, what do I need to do? No action is required from you other than awareness that services will be impacted. Like three sentences and it told me everything I need to know. Wi-Fi is unavailable. It's unavailable at these times. I don't need to do anything, but be aware that if I go in the office, it might not work. Done. And then you can actually go in and, and get more detail below the fold. They explain in greater depth, like here's the upgrades we're doing. We're going to swap out this hardware and we're going to make this change to this network and blah, blah, blah. So they tell you both. Um, but right away you get all the pertinent information that if you don't care really at a deeper level, you have enough to, to know what you need to do, or in this case, not do. And I think my final point really is there's this old school way of thinking, I think, where a lot of security folks come in and they want to bring the hammer down right away. And at some point, though, after you've done all these changes, after you've communicated it, after you've given them time and they've, you've given them the literature and the documentation on it, you didn't bring it down in the beginning. You went through the process. Everyone's aware of the change and everyone's been communicated. I think at that point is when you should bring it down, right? Like if you give them two weeks to enroll or 28 days in, in your case, Adam, at that 28 days, I mean, you make the change and you turn it on and then you kind of deal with the aftermath of all those people who weren't compliant and, you know, you give the help desk a heads up. Hey, mm -hmm. we're making the switch. Get ready. You know, here's the documentation for the troubleshooting. Here's the list of users impacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, you know, tell them what to expect. Tell them to, how to do the first line troubleshooting. 
okay, it's in tune, you know, maybe unenroll, re-enroll, you know, basic stuff, right? Turn it on, turn it off type stuff. <laughs> and if they, if they have issues, okay, escalate it to me and I'll, I'll figure it out, right? And go through the common things. So I think at some point, you do want to kind of pony up and, and not, you know, you don't want them to call your bluff essentially. <laughs> okay. Like we we said, we're going to turn it on at this time. Okay. We'll turn it on. Well, like we talked about there, there are some people who will not do it until it breaks. So you are going to be required to break it. You could send them a hundred emails. They will never do it until it breaks. So again, even in this organization that had that very, very, very permissive culture on not wanting to upset the apple cart ever, I did get permission after I sent like 10 emails that when the deadline hit, I cut them off. Even in that culture, I was still allowed to do that because that leader did understand that there are some people who just aren't going to move until it breaks, they're going to wait to see when it happens and then they will react because they don't want to do it a step earlier. They're going to wait for the gas light to turn on essentially in the car, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's, it's, but it's, it's not like bringing the hammer down in the traditional sense, right? You have given ample opportunity to become compliant. You've bent over backwards with communications and instructions and offers to help to do it. And if you just choose to ignore all of that, we have to move forward. We can't wait indefinitely because they will try to. And mm -hmm. that's just, that's how some people work and that's okay. We can, we can capture as many as we can and that's still going to be a requirement. So no, the other experience I had too is when it comes to like VIP, right? CEOs, board of directors, VPs, executives, all sorts of things. And I usually recommend paying special attention to them and holding them walking through the entire change process if it requires their individual action. So most of the time they're too busy to do something and that's understandable, mm -hmm. you know, work with their assistants, get time <laughs> on their schedule, you know, for my old company, the CEO, I mean, he understood the change was coming and that's important, right? To get buy off from the CEO, from the VPs and all that. He knew the change was coming. He knew that, it would impact him and he knew how it would impact him, but he just didn't have time to like walk through it for his own phone. Mm -hmm. So we scheduled time with his assistant, literally like during one of his meetings, he knew it was coming. She went in, grabbed his phone. I went up and I enrolled him into his, into MDM right there in, in the office. And so sometimes those folks, you just need to actually handhold them through the process and that's okay. The assistants know all their passwords anyway, and I know that's making people scream on an InfoSec show, but that's not changing anytime soon as much as I just hate to kind of throw up my hands. Like they know a lot about those people above and beyond just their passwords. Like they know their credit card numbers, their spouses, tastes, and it's amazing. Executive admins run the company. Don't be fooled. Those are actually the people running the company and you want them on your side, by the way. I have uh, run afoul of an executive admin or two in my day, and it is not a advisable move for advancing your career. So instead, buddy up with them and make them your best friend. You will do a lot better. I assure you of that. Hey, one final thought, as long as we're talking about this. So you're talking about kind of when to bring the hammer down, when time to move forward. The thing to consider with almost everything security is the boogeyman looming overhead is there could be at some point an incident where we don't get to make these changes on our schedule, when we don't get to do them in a smooth fashion. And so while it is certainly important to deliver in a way that is user-friendly and is as smooth as possible and is communicated well, there is also a sense of urgency. And especially for things like multi-factor authentication where the number of organizations that I have worked with and run of in, into where their MFA rollout was by the seat of their pants at the last minute after a security incident is way too many. And then I, I have other organizations that have taken over two years to deploy MFA and they're still not done because it is an impactful user change. I totally get that, but they're taking too long and eventually their hand is going to be forced and they're going to do it in a way that is fast and uncomfortable. So there is a balancing act here for sure. And we're not articulating that you should bring the hammer down or you should rush through any of this, but with 
everything security, once you've identified a risk and you have buy-off on mitigating the risk, there needs to be some sense of urgency to implement that change, or ultimately you're gonna be implementing that change in the middle of the night in a way that is terrible for everyone. So get it done and get it done in a timely fashion, but also with empathy and humanity and consideration of mind. That's a great point to end the show on, Adam. I totally agree with everything you just said there. So that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If there is a security topic that you want us to talk about or have questions on the show, please reach out to us. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.